Consistent with the person-centered planning and thinking approaches described by Michael Small, Patty Cotton and Susan Fox have detailed a framework and approach to facilitate person-centered planning in later life. The process and tools featured in the Tier 2 training modules are based on this publication. Cotton and Fox have worked with and conducted trainings for ADRCs and options counselors, so these tools have been used in working with older adults and people with disabilities who need decision support, including people with dementia. Patty Cotton and Susan Fox have adapted the team performance model for person-centered planning. The team includes the person with dementia, as well as family members or others who are important to them. The options counselor or case managers are also part of this team. In addition, others who provide daily support may also become members of the team. The phases of creating and implementing a person-centered plan are cumulative. Each builds on the one before. On the left side of the V are the creating stages and include orientation, trust building, and goal clarification. Once that's accomplished, the team can commit to a plan to achieve the goals that have been established. On the right side of the V are the sustaining stages of the model. These include implementation of the plan, a period of performance or maintaining the plan, and then renewal. The last two phases involve reviewing the plan and following up as needed. Again, the role of the options counselor or case manager is that of facilitator. Although seven distinct phases are listed, phases are cumulative. They often overlap and often flow seamlessly from one phase to the next. In this module, we begin with the orientation and trust building components of the model. These building blocks are critical for accurately identifying goals desired by the person with dementia as well as their family members. Before we describe these components of the model, let's meet two of the central characters in our stories. Remember, these vignettes are portrayed by actors. Dennis and his daughter Sally are just beginning their journey with dementia. Albert is the information and assistance worker who first met Dennis by phone. Dennis Smith called on Tuesday. He was pretty upset telling me he wanted to get food. At first, I thought maybe he was late getting a home-delivered meal or that he needed a delivery from the food bank. But as I listened and asked questions, he was soon telling me that people kept rearranging his kitchen and that his microwave was not working and that he was hungry. He was also upset that his daughter hadn't arrived to help him. He started repeating himself and seemed confused. I asked him if his daughter would be coming soon. He said no and was angry because she was late. I asked if her phone number was by the phone and it was. I asked if it would be all right if I called her to see if she could help figure out his lunch. He said he thought that was a good idea. When I called his daughter, she also seemed pretty upset, mostly because her father had called the ADRC. She said something like, I told him I'd be there at 12.30. This is getting out of hand. He calls me all the time and can't seem to remember anything. I'm so sorry he bothered you. I assured her it was no bother. As we talked more, I learned about his confusion and her frustration. I told her about options counseling, and she was willing to have someone call. I also suggested that she might find the 10 signs of Alzheimer's disease or dementia helpful, and she could find it on the ADRC's Alzheimer's webpage. I also offered to send it to her. Finally, I encouraged her to have Dennis examined by his physician because his confusion could be caused by many things that could be fixed. I gave Sophia, one of our options counselors, the referral, and she will be visiting with Dennis and his daughter this afternoon. Martha was well along in her journey with dementia before she came to the attention of the ADRC. This happened when a neighbor called the ADRC. Here's what she reported. I'm really concerned about Martha. I think this house is too big for her. Her yard is getting more unkept, and I know she has trouble keeping it up. I think she was sick last year. I've seen her get into the car to do her grocery shopping, but I'm not sure how long she can do that. I don't think she's safe. The car is getting pretty scratched up. She used to be a school teacher. She never married, and I don't know that she has any family. I remember her sister died about, oh, five years ago. She has friends come over sometimes, but I haven't seen anyone for quite a while. 
We're not really close, but we've been good neighbors for about 15 years. I've always enjoyed our visits when we both used to be working in the yard, and she always enjoyed my kids. Made them cookies all the time when they were little. I'm really worried that Martha is getting forgetful. She made a big dinner last week for her friends, but no one came. She was really upset about it. I don't think she remembered to invite anyone. She was really vague about who she thought would come. She even mentioned her sister. I called aging services and let them know. I'm not sure what I can do, but I don't think she should be alone. Services and information exist that can help Dennis and Martha. However, recall that a person-centered planning approach means that before we start talking to individuals and their families about formal supports, we need to know more about the goals that they have for living a meaningful life and how each of them want to receive support to achieve those goals. Suggesting services for any of these individuals is premature at this time. Let's return now to the first steps of the team performance model. Most people haven't used the formal service system. This is certainly true for the people portrayed in this series. It's a safe bet that these individuals and their families didn't know what an options counselor was, what he or she did in that role, or what support was available to them. They didn't know what they themselves could do to improve the situation. The ideas and processes related to person-centered planning were new to them. A major purpose of an orientation meeting is to frame the purpose of getting together. It involves helping people understand the purpose. Each one of them needs to understand why they are in the room, that is, the reason for the meeting and what they are expected to do. Another purpose is to help participants understand the potential for person-centered planning in their situation. This does not mean giving a lecture on person-centered planning. In Dennis's story, the options counselor, for example, will explain that the purpose of her visits is to get to know Dennis and what was important to him. This includes an understanding of Dennis's routines and what he wants to happen so that he can get a hot lunch when he wants it. At the same time, another important purpose of the visit is for the options counselor to better understand Dennis's daughter's needs and her ability to support Dennis. The potential for person-centered planning increases when participants understand the purpose of the meeting and recognize there are different perspectives that need to be considered, including their own. People with dementia and their families need to be recognized for their expertise and knowledge. Orientation also involves identifying membership on the team, that is, who should be involved in the discussion. One of the roles of the options counselor is to make sure all of the people who should be present are or that their perspectives are well represented. Self-interests simply means that the facilitator needs to figure out what is driving participants and how to tap into that information to engage them in a person-centered planning process. At the center of the team is the person with dementia. As we learned in the Tier 1 series, personhood is of great importance to the people with dementia. Maintaining the ability to direct one's own life is a common self-interest. Other important participants are family members or others who the person with dementia identifies as a support person. Self-interests may involve the need to figure out who can provide the care and what it will cost in time and money. It may mean that they want to gain new skills in working with people with dementia so that they are more effective in preventing behaviors that cause distress. Of course, self-interest may include providing as little support as possible or getting control over the person with dementia. Although this is not a typical response, the options counselor or case manager needs to be aware. If a family member's self-interest does not include supporting the person with dementia the way they want to be supported, the ability to develop a person-centered plan is particularly challenging. The professional role is that of a facilitator. The self-interests here involve doing a good job in facilitating a truly person-centered plan and in meeting agency expectations. A final component of the orientation stage of the process involves clarifying the intentions of everyone who participates, along with establishing group norms, boundaries, values, and expectations. To do this, it is important to establish a safe place for conversations. 
The options counselor needs active listening and facilitation skills to ensure that everyone feels heard and respected. The facilitator can also help individuals articulate their views of how they got to this place and the problems that they feel need to be addressed. Person-centered planning requires knowledge of the values and preferences of those who need support, including the person with dementia and their family members or support persons. The facilitator stresses the importance of a plan emerging from these values and preferences. Finally, the conversation should set expectations. What can the person with dementia or a family member be expected to do? What about the facilitator? Families may have unrealistic expectations about the kinds of services that are available to them, or they may want the facilitator to fix the problem rather than supporting to come up with solutions. They may not be aware of their strengths and abilities in this area. The team performance model of person-centered planning is supported by several visual tools that can be used in meetings with people with dementia. These have been organized into three categories which correspond to elements of the team performance model. In this module, we are focusing on tools of inquiry. These are tools that aid in collecting and organizing information that will help to build trust and understanding and lay the groundwork for a shared vision of goals and the development of a person-centered plan. Notice that the options counselor will ask Dennis about his daily routines and Martha's options counselor will focus on the timeline of her life. Options counselors and others using these tools use flip charts or a portable whiteboard. Why do we emphasize visual tools? They may seem like a lot of extra work. But think about this webinar and the importance of using appropriate visual aids to maintain your interest and help your understanding. About 60% of us are visual learners. That is, we learn best when we can see. About 15% more learn best by doing. Research demonstrates that these types of learners also benefit from visual tools. Using visual aids helps provide structure to a conversation and can help lead to discovery of important information that might not otherwise come up. They also help keep people focused on the task at hand. Visual tools reduce cognitive effort, which is especially helpful for people with dementia. Many people with dementia cannot follow conversations, but they can understand pictures or words. Visual tools also serve as a memory aid. Similarly, visual tools support language comprehension and learning and help people see the bigger picture. It also helps the options counselor or case manager with facilitation. By seeing their comments or concerns printed for all to see, family members and people with dementia can feel heard and it evens the playing field. It also reduces some of the repetitive comments, identifies individual and group strengths, and helps to manage conflict. Finally, meetings with visual tools often take less time than meetings without them because they help meetings run more smoothly. In our three stories, we will illustrate three different tools of inquiry that were used to learn more about the situations of the characters in our stories, two in this module and one in module six. In later modules, we will illustrate decision-making and implementation tools. Earlier, the information and assistance worker described Dennis's call to the ADRC and his subsequent conversation with Dennis's daughter, Sally. In this scene, the options counselor is meeting with Dennis and his daughter for the first time. This visit is important for many reasons. She will help them learn her role and begin building trust. At this meeting, Sally is overwhelmed and is ready to tell the options counselor all that is going wrong. Not all families will do this and you might discuss later how Sophia might have handled the conversation differently, but pay attention to the multiple issues that Sally, Dennis's daughter, raises. Remember that these are actors. So Sally, why don't you tell me a little bit about the experience and what, what your thoughts are? Oh, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm at my wit's end. That's what my thoughts are. I mean, you have no idea. Dad is getting so hard to handle right now. I mean, it's it's like he's totally spoiled and can't do anything on his own. He's absolutely demanding all the time. I mean, look, and, and it's, it's bad enough that he calls me. Now he's calling other people all the time. There's no reason for you to call her to talk about your lunch. Right. I don't get it. Now, here's the thing. My sister thought 
that a new microwave would help him with lunch, right? Because he was complaining he couldn't get his lunch done right. Mm -hmm. Then he couldn't figure out the microwave, so she got him this simple one. There's only like seven buttons on it, but somehow he can't figure out how to use the new microwave. So he won't use the new microwave, but the problem is she got rid of the old microwave. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that anymore now. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have anything that he can use right now. And mm -hmm. oh my God, it's like trying to keep track of everything. It's Good. become my job to do everything for him. I, I, I put his medicine in those you know little pill containers where it has all the days of the week because that's what you said you needed, but for some reason that's not working. So I have to keep track of the medicine too. And I, I oh, I just, I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do now. I, I mean, my God, I, you know, it's, it's just so, he's calling me up all the time. I mean, he was, he started calling me up at night. He started calling me up at night because he couldn't figure out where his news program was. It's like, Dad, my God, I gotta get some sleep too, you know? There's no reason to call me at night. And that's okay. I that's didn't do that. I mean, but the thing is, is that it's just, it's just, I, I have a sister. She helps, sort of, kind of, some, but I mean, I can't do everything. I mean, my husband is not all that well himself and, you know, come on, I'm not as young as I used to be. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to just spill like this, but it's well, just so frustrating. It's like mom totally spoiled you, dad, and you I, you can't do anything for yourself. I, I don't know what happened. You like, I don't know, mom did everything, but she's not here now, so it's just me, and I, I can't keep up with everything. That's I, okay. I my sister thinks he's fine, but the honest truth, yes. I think he needs to go to a nursing home. I'm not I, going to no nursing home. So who are you? What do you want? Mr. Smith, I'm Sophia. Mr. Smith, it's very important that we come to see how we can help both sides and I can get to know some things. I would really like to know some more about both of you. My name is Sophia and I am hired by the county and my purpose here is to try to help you out with numerous resources that are out there. I am an expert in resources and I can help you out to know what is out there. I am not an expert in your lives. Everybody is, has a different personality and a different situation. Yeah. But we can get to the bottom of this just if we could find some some ways of solving a few little problems at first. Okay. I can stay home and learn the same thing and, and I can be as a nurse at home. And yeah. that's what we want. And I am here to make sure that I listen to you and both of you, and what are your needs? If your choice is to stay here, there are many, many resources that, yeah. that we have available for you to be able to stay in your home if that's what you choose to do, Mr. Smith. Why is that so hard? We just have to discuss these things. Right, right. Let's reflect on what we've just observed. How did Sophia help to orient Dennis and Sally to the purpose of coming together? Sophia was able to clarify the purpose of her visit, Importantly, she said that she was there to listen to them and learn more about them. She also let them know there were many options and she would help them find options that would work for both Dennis and Sally once she got to know them better. In this first meeting, membership of the team consisted of Dennis, Sally, and Sophia. Sophia clarified her role was to help them find a solution based on their goals and needs. Dennis and Sally each have interests to be supported. Right now, they are at odds. His is to maintain his routines and be at home, and hers include her father's safety and a more manageable role. Finally, Sophia learned about Lola, Dennis's other daughter. She also learned about tensions between the two daughters, at least from Sally's perspective. As Sophia talks with the family more, she will suggest that Dennis's other daughter be involved in future discussions. You may not encounter many situations where a family member is this vehement and outspoken about their situation, particularly in front of her parent. A more experienced options counselor might have been able to lower the volume and change the tone of the conversation early on, but this story does illustrate the tensions and frustrations that often arise in families as a parent begins to decline. Family conflicts in the past will still be present, and previous interaction will likely prevail. So, did Sophia set the stage for building relationships and trust? Was it a safe place for Sally? Being able to express her frustrations likely contributed to Sally feeling heard. How about for Dennis? What did we learn about individual perspectives? It's clear that Sally does not have a good understanding of dementia, so she thinks that Dennis's behaviors result from his stubbornness and being spoiled. 
We know that Dennis wants to be at home and is adamantly opposed to a nursing home. The tension between Sally and Dennis could reflect a lifelong pattern, or it could be a result of changing roles and expectations. She may have a similar relationship with her sister. We will revisit this in Module 7. The options counselor is beginning to get a sense of their values and preferences, but it will take more conversation to answer this question. Clarifying expectations will emerge as the process continues, but Dennis and Sally know that the options counselor is there to learn more about them and help them find a solution. Sally is overwhelmed with the emerging responsibilities and also needs support, but this support must be balanced with what is important to and important for Dennis. As you know, building trust is fundamental to working with individuals and families and supporting them as they navigate the world of living with dementia. The options counselor or case manager is critical for building trust among the participants as well as trust in the process. The professional can go a long way by listening to the unique issues of the situation without preemptively solving the problem. This can be difficult when you know that a particular approach or service will be helpful. But first, the process calls for engaging with the person with dementia, making sure their personhood is protected and the person remains at the center of and involved with the planning. The families also need to feel heard and respected. In addition to building an understanding, there is a focus on strengths, validating points of view, and encouraging communication. In the next scene, observe how Sophia builds trust as she seeks to get to know Dennis better. This is the inquiry phase of navigating choices. Sophia needs to get to know Dennis and Sally and identify what is important to them and who else should be in the room. See how focusing on Dennis's routines puts him in the center of the discussion and helps his daughter think in more productive ways. Let's take a look. It might be useful if I get to know a little bit more about your routine and then your life, Mr. Smith, yeah, we'll so that we can see what are things that might be able to help you in your everyday activities. Well. Uh-huh. And, uh, and to make okay. your life better and to make your everything that you're doing easier All so right. we can help you. Well... What do you think? Is that good? It seems like that's all right. It seems fair. Wonderful. Okay. So now, why don't we talk a little bit about what is a typical day for you, Dennis? What happens first thing when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> he gets up at the crack of dawn. Well, I, <laughs> all I right. get the paper. I uh -huh. like to read the you paper read the in the morning. Damn, my uh, paper boy deliver it. Oh, Dan, I told you, the paper doesn't come every day anymore. Yeah. Oh. Right. Well, how the hell the paper, if it, if you have a paper, why, why doesn't it come each day? There's news every day. Dad, come on, you, you don't know what's happening right now. I mean, look, we have gone over this, that, 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 that it's been quite the hot topic, actually. Why can't I the have paper, the damn paper in the morning? It doesn't come every single day. They change the, the schedule. Things change sometimes, mm -hmm. Dad, you know, and that's one of the things that changes. The paper doesn't come every day. Okay. Hmm? All right. So, um, all right. So, the days that you do get your paper, do you do you read the paper with your coffee? Do you make coffee? I drink coffee and I uh -huh. read the paper. Okay. Yes. All right. So when it drink. comes, <laughs> if it comes. <laughs> okay. Do you eat breakfast? I like a cereal, and I put raisins and nuts in it. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, yep. that's healthy. That's good. All right, yeah, he, he usually does get his own breakfast. I mean, I, I have to bring the cereal and the milk and the raisins and walnuts or whatever he wants that week. But okay. yeah, and and then he he uh, he does clean up uh, after himself. He washes his dishes. I'll give him that. Mm -hmm. you know. Let's reflect a moment on this scenario. What did you observe? What did Sophia do well? What else would you do to get to help build trust? In this next part of the conversation, the options counselor helps Dennis and Sally to begin a plan to support Dennis's routines. See how Sophia helped Dennis and Sally think about supporting some of the routines they identified. Okay, so we, we have been talking about, I just want to make absolutely sure that we come up with a plan that will observe all the priorities that Dennis has yeah. and his needs, and then can also incorporate some of the concerns and the priorities that Sally, your daughter, has. How yeah. does that sound? That Is that sounds, a good plan? Sounds fair. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if there are a few things that we could do to support the needs and maybe the things that you need to 
to get figured out in your daily uh, routine. Uh, for example, that paper thing, let's say, uh, yeah, the, the dip, <laughs> well, the paper thing, how about, um, what would help you? What do you think would help you if um, you know that it's not coming every single day? What can remind you that that day the paper is not going to be there? Oh, God. I, I don't know. Well, now, sometimes I do leave notes for Dad, and, and he does read them. Oh, good. So. Okay. Oh, so maybe that would be of help. Maybe if Sally would write you a, a note and put it on the door... Would you be able to read that and then remember that the paper's not coming that day? Well, that sounds fair. Yeah, that's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. not bad. And then uh, maybe on the days that you don't have a paper, the day's off, then you could read some of... What else do you have for reading? You have a Sports Illustrated magazine. Oh, well, it's great. Luis Suarez. Art. Oh, Luis Suarez, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he bites. <laughs> Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> so I'm glad. Yeah, that would help. That would help reading some other material. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did you watch the World Cup? I watched the World Cup for the first time. I uh, got interested in soccer from the heart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, all I heard about time. for a while there was it soccer. It hard this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Very good. Sophia charted Dennis's routines on a tool called the Routines Map. She did this by taking notes and then creating the following chart. She could also have done this directly on a flip chart. Here are some of the things that were listed in his Routines Map. It listed when and where the important events of the day and week occurred. This information will be very important in helping Dennis and his family identify goals and actions needed to improve their situation. Note that Saturday he has breakfast with golfing friends, he visits with grandchildren and great-grandchildren on the weekends sometimes. His daughter brings his meals for the week on Sundays, and that he enjoys cards. He also talks with his daughter regularly, the daughter who lives at a distance. The Routines map helped Sally and Dennis focus on creating a detailed description of Dennis's support needs and the assistance that Dennis required on a daily or weekly basis. Sophia helped Sally see that Dennis had many strengths. He was doing a lot for himself. She also acknowledged the multiple ways that Sally was providing support, and she took seriously Dennis's concerns about the microwave and his newspaper. These were important steps in building trust and beginning the first stages in developing a plan that addressed the immediate concerns and strengths of both. As we noted, a key family member was missing from the conversation. At Sophia's urging, Sally set up another meeting the next time her sister was in town. Sophia also encouraged Sally to think about who could support her. Sally mentioned her daughter, Keisha. As a result, in the next family meeting to develop a complete action plan, Dennis, both of his daughters, his granddaughter, his friend, Fred, and the options counselor participated. We will learn more about the results of that meeting and the plan they developed in Module 6. Let's now move on to Martha's story. She may have a more challenging situation because she has no apparent support beyond a concerned neighbor with limited abilities to help. Martha has undiagnosed dementia, and although she had strong social ties in the past, most of her closest friends have died, moved away, or are also increasingly frail and unavailable. Martha's dementia has progressed to the point that her capacity to make decisions for herself is questionable. After talking with Martha's neighbor, Michael called her. She seemed confused, but agreed to meet with him. He asked Leanne to join them for this meeting to help Martha feel more comfortable. He sent an appointment card and two reminder calls to Martha to increase the likelihood that she would be at home. He also enlisted Leanne's support. She reminded Martha about the appointment and assured her that she would be present. To get to know Martha and build trust, Michael helped Martha construct a timeline of significant events in her life. Leanne helped fill in some blanks. Here is that chart. A timeline provides a structure that helps the person and family or other people who are significant to the person relay important life events and life experiences that have shaped the person's belief system, values, and point of view. It is especially helpful to use with people with cognitive impairment. One of the most useful aspects of a timeline is that the content is determined completely by the person, not by an assessment form. 
In this way, the events and milestones that are most significant to the person come to the forefront. Important information might be missed otherwise. The process helps to identify good times and difficult times. As the timeline emerges, the facilitator listens for themes, previous coping styles, cultural and family traditions that are important to the person, medical history, accomplishments, and interests. Most people with dementia can participate successfully in this exercise because memories of past significant events are most clear. In fact, this tool is quite helpful for someone with cognitive impairment. Creating the timeline stimulates further conversation and elaboration. For example, when Michael drew the schoolhouse, Martha became very animated, talking about particular students and some of the activities she developed to help them learn. From there, the conversation continued with her telling the options counselor about her choice of teaching over marriage and her ultimate decision for early retirement. Once it was completed, Michael took a photo of the timeline with his phone and uploaded it to the ADRC database. He left the chart posted in Martha's house and it became a focus of conversations for all of those who visited. Over time, new things were added to the timeline as Martha talked about them. Some of the things Michael learned, in addition to having an enjoyable conversation, helped him learn critical information about developing this person-centered plan. She became less anxious as they talked. In addition to providing information about what was important to her, the process helped build trust with the options counselor. She was willing to show him her address book, which led him to people who had been important to Martha in the past. Michael also learned where Martha had volunteered and made contact with the volunteer coordinator at the hospital and with the director of the tutoring program. The hospital volunteer coordinator tracked down some people who had volunteered when Martha had, and he was then able to enlist some short-term support for Martha. Martha also showed some of her medication to Michael so he could get the name of her physician. He arranged an appointment with the physician and transportation to get her to the doctor. Her neighbor made sure that Martha was ready to go. We will continue to follow the decision-making process with Martha in Module 6. In this module, we talked about person-centered planning and illustrated some tools options counselors use to get to know the person with dementia and their unique needs. Sophia focused on learning about Dennis's routines and Michael used the timeline. Each approach was selected because the options counselors felt they could get the most useful information to really understand the situation from the perspectives of those most directly involved, the person with dementia, and in Dennis's story, his daughter's perspective as well. In Module 6, we will meet Sarah, a person with younger onset Alzheimer's, and her husband Bill. We will learn about a third tool of inquiry as we learn more about Sarah's story. In Module 6, we will explore the next phases of the team performance model, specifically identifying goals, the roles of various team members, establishing commitment to a plan to meet those goals, and taking action to implement the plan. We will check in with Dennis and his family and see how plans are coming together for Martha. Thank you for participating. Here are some of the individuals who contributed to this program. This training was developed by Portland State University on behalf of Oregon Department of Human Services, Aging, and People with Disabilities. Funding for this project was provided by an Administration for Community Living grant and funding provided by the Oregon Legislature for mental health training. This concludes Module 5. Please copy this link and complete the short feedback form. We want to know your opinions about the module and how to improve programs in the future. Thank you again for your attention and your support for people with dementia and their families.